This session is on uh, using idea data for faculty evaluation. So I want you now to pretend, if you're not already, maybe you don't have to be, that you are in the position where you need to evaluate faculty, which means you need to use professional judgment. Uh, we can give you numbers, but they're numbers. You have to do other things with numbers. And um, how the question that this session seeks to address is, what's the best way to situate idea within a whole context of faculty evaluation? Okay. So that's the goal here, and specifically, we're going to talk about um, a broader picture, foundations for an evaluation system, uh, a three-phase process for faculty evaluation. We're going to take a few slides and talk about other types of evidence, because usually people will ask, well, you say 30 to 50 percent should be idea, well, what about the rest of the um, evaluation for uh, teaching, what should we use? So I'm just going to give you some suggestions, or just um, my ideas from, from doing this for many years. Um, many of them I know, on, I have checked your website, College of Arts and Sciences and College of Education and Professional Studies. You have things listed, I believe, on the website that show um, other forms of evidence for teaching effectiveness. So I know that you and I will, what I say here will resonate with you. There may be some new ideas. But the important thing is we're trying to situate how I think fits within that picture. We'll talk a little bit about validity because I know there's been some concern about, well, does idea really measure what we say it measures? So I've got a few slides to talk about that, although I'm not a statistician, I can share with you some tests that we've done and results that we found and point you to the resources if you are a statistician and like to go deep into that. Um, how to use the reports appropriately as an evaluator. So keep in mind, all of these um, slides we're talking about now is you're looking at it from a different point of view. And then we'll have time to um, get in there and, and do some practice. So administratively, uh, let's just stipulate to these um, aspects of a good faculty evaluation system. It should be systematic and thoughtful. It should be formative and summative. It should be multidimensional, looking at different aspects, and use multiple sources. Uh, it should have clear guidelines that are pre-established, and um, the person doing the evaluation needs to understand that professional judgment needs to be used with subjective data. Uh, sometimes when I go to a campus, got people say, well, I just want the number. I want, I'm looking for a certain number, and I'm just going to use that number. Let me say back up a minute and let's situate this in a bigger picture and allow you as the professional in the department to make judgment with me. Uh, the evaluation system should link with faculty rewards and awards. Um, I don't know if you've got a, a, a system here for um, uh, teaching awards, but uh, it should be situated within the system. It should be straightforward, accurate, and complete. Focus on teaching improvement and use valid and reliable instruments. So this is the image I like to use to talk about a three-phase process for faculty evaluation. And I can tell you that as I go across the country and meet people at different colleges and universities, I see them at all different ends of the spectrum here. And the idea here is that you set expectations first, what you're looking for, and decide what kind of data you're going to need to uh, establish whether or not those expectations have been met. And then uh, use the feedback in appropriate ways to uh, establish what we have. <laughs> what I find is some people are uh, collecting feedback prior to having clear-cut expectations set and communicated. Sometimes they set expectations, but they're collecting data that's probably not going to be the best data. Or maybe they're collecting all kinds of data. They don't really know how to use the data. So I'd like to start with this slide to point out that all three of these aspects are important to having a good, holistic faculty evaluation system. Part of developing the uh, expectations is coming up with categories of performance. 
and I believe it's the um, um, College of, of Education and Professional Studies, has three categories, which is actually my preference. Does not meet expectations, meets expectations, exceeds expectations. Other schools, other colleges here may have uh, five a category uh, scale such as that. But the important thing is that you decide what are your major categories of performance and establish them and communicate them. Now remember, the overarching goal here is um, clinical reflection. So they're using the data to improve because um, one of the things you have established in your strategic plan is that you are a learning organization, as in um, Senge's work, a learning organization. And according to O'Banion's work in terms of being a learning college, you're going to be doing this as a university, getting feedback and learning about yourselves and trying something new. So as an evaluator, I would submit to you that you're not only concerned about the scores, but how are the data, how are the faculty using those data to engage in reflection and improvement? So we suggested that you use multiple forms of evidence, and um, uh, what we suggest is a student rating to be part of that, but also artifacts. I'm going to give you uh, some examples of that. And what I'm calling external perspective. What do others think about that? And the balance plan for some of the evaluation lies somewhere in the um, intersection of those three ways of looking at faculty teaching performance. So what are some, uh, some artifacts that you might ask a faculty member to collect and put in his or her portfolio to demonstrate teaching effectiveness? Well, obvious, the obvious ones syllabi, a graphic organizer, how you have demonstrated something for your students, um, assignments and project descriptions. So an actual description of the assignment, what it is you have given to your students, so you could use this as an artifact of showing how you are designing assignments that get at certain types of learning. Along with that would be the rubrics that you're using to evaluate those assignments and how you are using the rubrics. Are you giving the rubrics to the students ahead of time with the assignment and so on and so forth. Written teaching philosophies are often included in one's portfolio and for uh, promotion and tenure. Uh, so I would encourage that. But notice I have a reflections after that. And what I'm going to suggest is that one might use page three of one's idea report for reflection. And I'm going to be showing you later a faculty uh, data worksheet that has some reflection questions that are really nice. You might encourage faculty who are building their portfolio or going up for performance review to reflect on page three. If, if you see that your report is telling you to consider increasing the use of teaching methods 16, 18, 19, as we saw earlier today, what did you do about it? Did you decide, yeah, I think 16 is going to be useful. Here's what I did. I read about it. I talked to so-and-so about it. I was doing it. I visited his class. I got some ideas. And then I, I actually did it this semester. And here are the results. That would be a great one-page reflection that could be included in um, as an artifact for teaching effectiveness. Obviously, samples of student work would be uh, a good source of artifacts. And then CATs, are you all familiar with CATs? Classroom Assessment Techniques. Um, popularized by Pat Cross from Berkeley and Tom Angelo, who's now in Australia. But their book, uh, Angelo Cross, Classroom Assessment Techniques, is a Bible for quick assessment. And in the K through 12 world, you may, you may, know, the, may know the term exit tickets. Exit tickets, yeah. So what you do is, is you ask your students at the end of the class, I could have done this right before the break, I could have said, write down one question that you had. Um, even though we've, we've spent some time together and now you're going on a break, I'd love to know what question is just burning in your mind right now. You hand it to me on the way out the door. That's a question that's sent to me. So how do you make that an artifact? Well, you do it with your students, you collect it, you analyze it, and then you write it up in a, in a one-page uh, summary. 
here's what I did, here's what I learned, and then when I went back to class the next day, I addressed the main question that kept coming back. And we uh, discussed it, and the students felt like they had answers to that question, and we were able to move on. So, classroom assessment technique and the results. You can write that up in a one-page reflection as another typical or type of artifact. So, external perspective, if faculty are being invited to give presentations, that's certainly admirable and something that should be included. <coughs> Alumni surveys, uh, focus groups on gra of graduating students for um, faculty member is mentioned. I'm going to talk a little bit about classroom observation in this session, and in uh, the last session today, I'm going to talk about classroom presentation. <coughs> and here's how I differentiate between them. Classroom observation is done by someone who's trained in teaching and learning and, and, and classroom observation. And uh, can provide you with a, a wealth of information that will help you to make improvement efforts. Um, but also uh, can provide you with more substantive types of data. Classroom visitation is formative only, in my view. Um, all the literature I have read on peer review is that it should be formative only uh, because of interior reliability and all those other types of issues. Uh, but there's a there's great value in that, and we're going to talk about that later today. But for now, um, let's talk about classroom observations. Um, classroom observation in the sense of it being more like ethnographic practice. So it's not a pure ethnography where you would, would um, become a member of that class for the whole semester like, a, like an anthropologist would, you know, and take a few notes and, and the whole semester would be planted in there and then write a study on that would That would be a full ethnographic study. But you go in there to observe as if you are the observer. You're just capturing everything you see. And you're not imposing on that setting something, a preconceived notion of what should be happening. Instead, you're going in and capturing what is happening and then going from there. So the process is like observation in the field. You're seeking to understand the context. And it's characterized by thick description using the lens of culture. So you're going in to see what's going on here. What are the students? What's the subject? Um, what's the room like? Uh, what are the dynamics that are going on? So you're trying to capture everything that you see. The product would be a report that includes these rich descriptions of themes that emerge as you look at your qualitative data, categories, trends, and some interpretation. So here's what I do. I, I create a sheet like this with a time on the far left, what happened, and what is said. And I've, I've gotten fast at this, so it takes a little uh, while to practice it, but you go in, you sit down, and you start writing down everything that happens. The time, what happens, what the instructor says, what the student says. And you do that, you try to keep up with it in 45 minutes or so, and you get a really good picture, a snapshot in time, of the dynamics of that classroom. Then I also draw out what the classroom looks like, as if I were up on the ceiling looking down. So I would draw like long tables here, and a circle for each seat, empty, seats are just blank, and then uh, put the gender in, whatever demographic I'm looking for uh, that I might want to capture. And then I begin to uh, map out the flow of communication. So this instructor's talking, talking, talking. Oh, there's some questions and answers. Oh, look here. There's some talking in the back of the room. Now, I don't make any value judgment here. I don't go to the teacher and say, oh, you have to do this talking in the back of the room. No, I just say, here's what I see. And the teacher might say, oh, well, you know, he had mono, he's out for two weeks. And I ask this other guy to two of him. I don't know. I'm just capturing what I see. And that kind of lowers the stakes for the faculty member, too, because the faculty member doesn't feel like you've got a preconceived agenda when you come into class. You're just capturing your name, and you're going to talk to the instructor later about what it is that you saw. The classroom visitation is best used for formative purposes and used within a context of community of practice. Community of Practice is a learning theory that came out of the um, 90s. I don't know if you're familiar with it. We'll talk more about that later today. But basically, it's a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do, and they want to learn how to do it better by interacting regularly. So we're going to talk later today about how to build that community of practice among yourselves as faculty, how you can learn from one another. We are trying to establish a community of practice, and I think we're off on a good start, with our idea help community, which I'm going to show you later today. 
which is online, where you can get online and post questions and other clients can see them with our blog postings and so forth, where you're learning from one another. Our user group meeting, which is, takes place about every 18 months or so, where you can come and hear presenters from all over the country who are doing wonderful things with the idea, phenomenal um, presentations we saw last October. Uh, all these things where you're networking and finding out who's doing what with idea and what university and what college and so forth. That's a community of practice. But we can build a community of practice right here among faculty. Then, of course, um, student ratings. And we uh, already talked about the fact that it should be administered appropriately and um, uh, collect six to eight reports, more if there are fewer than 10 students, and uh, it should be no more than 30 to 50%. We believe that by and large, comments should be formative. Now, that doesn't mean that you never look at a comment for some of the purposes. We just know that oftentimes a student might have his or her lens out of focus and say something really bizarre or, or inappropriate and um, off the mark. Um, sometimes it tells us more about the student than it does about the faculty member. So keep in mind that a, a random comment lacks reliability. And you haven't really asked every student about that. So primarily comments should be formative. But if you're seeing a trend come in, faculty members always late, or faculty members rude, or if you see this come in regularly now that you're beginning to establish some reliability, it might be something you want to explore. But by and large, formative. Be mindful of the standard error of measurement on the five-point scale, it's plus or minus 0.3. So when you're making a judgment about someone's performance, you should keep that in mind. And um, it's plus or minus three for the converted scores. Uh, use an instrument that focuses on learning and use an instrument that has strong validity and reliability. So what is validity? Validity, as, as you all know, is to the extent to which, in our case here, we'll say um, the student rating items accurately measure some aspect of teaching and learning that is important to effectiveness. So we've got a, a series of different studies that uh, point to a strong case for validity for the ID instrument. And they can all be found in Technical Report 12. So if you're interested and, and you're a math person or a statistics person and you'd like to really get into the nitty gritty, I invite you to download that and take a look at it. I just going to uh, mention a couple other things. You can also look at Idea Research Report number two. And idea paper number 50 is the most recent literature review on student ratings in general, but also it talks about idea. It's written by Steve Benton, our senior research officer, and it's sort of like our Bible of student ratings and instruction right now. We're referring to it all the time whenever we get questions about um, the instrument or student ratings in general. So I uh, recommend those sources to you. So here's one type of um, study that we did, we found that there is a strong connection between what instructors say they emphasize on the top of the information form and the student progress on those types of learning that the students uh, uh, write on their, their diagnostic form or their short form. So for instance, if you say I'm emphasizing writing, students are likely to rate their communication skills high. You say I'm emphasizing group work, they're writing team skills. You say, I am emphasizing critical thinking. They are uh, uh, rating their progress on critical analysis as high, and likewise with creative endeavor and creative capacities. That was one. Another one is, there are high correlations between student progress on relevant objectives and teaching methods that make sense. So, when instructors select creative capacity, number six is important or essential, we see that students report more frequent use of methods such as, I think this is number seven, explain reasons for criticism of students' academic performance and required original or creative thinking. And I think I have one more. Um, there are positive correlations between students' self-reports of progress on relevant objectives and their actual performance on course exams. And what we see here is that when students rated four or five, they actually performed better on course exams. And I have the uh, citation for that research that was done by um, Steve Benton, our senior research officer there. He's in, there in the slides. So you get the slides if you'd like to read that. It's also cited in the idea paper 50. So we feel pretty confident. You can feel pretty confident. You're the faculty 
evaluator, and your faculty comes to you and says, these are just popularity contests. Um, if they're not valid, um, they might say, well, all these items on here, are, we're asking our students to rate things like creative capacities, and, and we're not doing that. <clears throat> well, one of the things you can say is that any good survey that's validated will have items on it that might not seem to fit for the responder. That's how we do validity studies. And so, uh, also you can point to them to the various types of validity studies that we've done to um, give them assurance that the instrument is, um, you can have confidence in the results. Now, is it perfect? No, no instrument. And that's why we say don't use it as the sole determiner of a person's performance evaluation. It should be used in conjunction with all those other things we talked about. So that's why we're situating it in this context. So what does this require in terms of idea, in terms of setting expectations? Remember, um, you, can, you can have two different types of data for the idea. You have criterion referenced or norm referenced, right? So the criterion reference is on the left-hand side, it's on the five-point scale. So you could decide as a unit or as a supervisor, maybe you're supervising some adjuncts, whatever the situation may be, you might decide we're going to look for a certain range on the uh, five-point scale. If you do that, recognize that some objectives are more difficult to achieve progress on for students than others. So you need to keep that in consideration. Also, you should make sure that the objectives are authenticated. Here's what we mean by that. Uh, it goes back to Amanda's situation. Really. Her objective of critical thinking for biology for non-majors was not a good choice. And so after we sat down and talked about it, she came up with a better set of objectives for that course. That was, um, that was a process of authenticating. We suggest that you as faculty sit together in your um, department meetings or program meetings <coughs> and authenticate your objectives. Decide, okay, should this be on there, should that be on there? Well, think about the substitute courses and what are our program goals and what are the university goals for our vision? What about our QEP? And decide together what objectives should be selected for these courses, or at least a set of them. You may allow room for faculty to select one or two more given his or her expertise in a particular area or desire, something like that. I'm not trying to uh, stamp out academic freedom or anything, but, but having conversations about what objectives should be selected is important, especially when you are sitting in that seat now as an evaluator, because the results that you're going to look at are dependent upon which objectives are selected. So you see how important that is to understand were those the correct objectives to have been selected? Or you can use norm reference standards, and then you decide which um, comparison group you're going to use, or maybe you'll use more than one, maybe you use all three. And sometimes that's good to look at it from this direction, look at it from that direction, and get multiple pictures of how your faculty are doing. <coughs> Just keep in mind what we talked about earlier that. Um, Student ratings are negatively skewed, so you're going to see them generally going high. And, and when you're comparing them, you're comparing them to self-selected universities and colleges and faculty, generally speaking, uh, of schools that care about teaching and learning. So you want to look for, are the scores falling in that gray area or above? If, they, if you see scores come across your desk and they're below the gray area, I would say first start with a yellow flag and go back and talk to that faculty member about the objectives that were selected. Go over those objectives. Did you really target these objectives? And the one thing that I have seen is I've looked at a stack of your group summary reports over and over and over and over. I see uh, probably too many objectives being selected. Eight for an average, nine for an average of the group. Um, so, if you're evaluating faculty, here's my point, and they have selected too many objectives erroneously because they just didn't know better, or they just are so passionate, like Amanda, 
uh, you don't want to penalize them. For it. You just want them to learn a better way to complete the survey and to go forward doing better with that. So it's important when you're making major decisions about faculty that um, you uh, understand that. So then you can just plop up those scores from the discipline and the institution to see how they are doing and, and look at it from three different views. So um, here's the um, course categories now. I often get asked, well, how do we put the numbers? What, what number means good? What number means bad? And we don't tell you that. We don't give you a value judgment on that. We just give you your data for you to make those decisions. I will give you an example in the next slide of how it could fall out, but I don't want you to think that this is it, you know, what I'm going to show you next. I have the word example in capital letters and underlined. It's just one way you can think about it. It's up to you to decide how those numbers fall out. But this is a, a way that it could look. Uh, below acceptable standards would either be 3.0 on the raw or the Python scale of criterion reference. Or, on the right, you've got the normative scores or the comparison scores, which we've converted to T-scores, <coughs> so below 38. And um, 3.0, 3.4, marginal, improvement needed. Notice that these are ranges. And they are ranges because of the standard error measurement. And so we are recommending that you not make major decisions about a person's promotion or tenure or reappointment or selecting one adjunct over another based on a tenth of a point. So uh, we have categories and ranges and I'm showing you here how you can do it with criterion reference or norm reference data. Okay? So <clears throat> Ken mentioned the report um, and here's what I like to say about it. The best thing about an idea, one of the best things about an idea, is the richness of the report. One of the most challenging things about idea is the richness of the report. Right? And you get all this in a four-page document. You get data. So pull out a report for a minute, and we'll take a look at it. My papers are all mixed up now, are yours? <laughs> uh, oh, you have yours. If you look at the back page of your four page report, <coughs> what you'll see is data. There you see your frequencies, your means, your standard deviations. There's your data. So even if you didn't select it as important or essential, you'll see how students responded. There is one item back there that we just didn't have room to put the responses on the front, and it's the one that would pertain to dispositions. Uh, item 42, I think it is, overall, I rate this course. No, 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 no. As a result of taking this course, I have more positive things to study. Is it number 40? 40, number 40. Uh, that won't show up anywhere but there. So if you want the, those uh, results, you have to look there for it. But, yeah. I'm sorry. Are you talking about the mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so the back page there, um, you have your data. So now turn to the front page. And what we've done is we've taken those data and we've calculated them with the scores. I would call that information. So now you have your progress on your own objective score. You've got your um, um, summary scores there and your, your overall score at the bottom there. Okay? And then we take those scores and we take into consideration uh, variables that are outside your control and comparison groups. So I'm going to call that knowledge. Now you're looking at your adjustments and your comparisons. So we've gone from data to knowledge, excuse me, information, and now we've got knowledge. So now the question is, what do we do about it? And I'm not suggesting that if you simply use idea, you're going to become wise. That would be nice. But as you engage with page three and try new things, 
that's when a faculty member can begin to develop wisdom uh, for his or her craft of teaching in that field. It takes time. You try this, you try that. Um, you reflect on it. How did it go? How did it, you also have other variables coming in at you for different different reasons. So um, so that's that's how I look at the report. The back page gives you your data, the front page gives you information and knowledge, and then you can begin to use that knowledge and work towards becoming a wise practitioner by engaging with page three. So you might want to keep that in mind as you talk to your faculty and you're engaging in um, uh, evaluation. Um, help them understand. They, you know, they may say, well, this report is just overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Well, let's just look at page one. We're going to look at your sum of the scores. All the data on the back, and we're not going to talk about page three yet because that's formative. Right now we're going to look at some of it. But when you're doing evaluation, you're talking about some of the purposes, right? So I just want to give you that picture um, to help delineate the whole report. So I had this reflective cycle at the top of the pyramid to, to demonstrate that you don't just get wise, you have to engage in that. Okay, so for personnel decisions, then, you're going to primarily rely upon pages one and two. We do not recommend that you use page three to make personnel decisions. Page three is reformative piece. Page three is all those teaching methods we talked about earlier. Instead, you want to know how well our students are ready learning, and you're going to get that primarily from pages one and two. What the students' perceptions of the course and their learning. Another important thing you want to look at is representativeness. So back to the front page of the report now. I'm going to look up at the gray box and notice, first of all, reliability, how many students were in the class. And then secondly, representativeness, what was the uh, representation, what was the percentage <coughs> response rate? We'd like to see at least 65%. And so we have to work on that here. So, I think your average is somewhere around 43. <coughs> so as a whole, we all need to work on it at Jacksonville State. I have heard good stories about certain colleges and programs getting really high grades. So it can be done. And the mobile access is going to help a lot. Um, the other thing I was thinking when Ken was talking about that is if you have mobile access, maybe he alluded to this, but you've got your captured audience. They're doing it. But those students who didn't make it to class, had you been using paper, their chance is gone. But they still have their chance. The window's still open. They can still do it. So there's a possibility you could even get higher than paper. How about that thought? I don't know if it's plausible or not, but it's possible. So uh, we need to work on that because when you are making a, a judgment about a faculty member and you only have 43% response rate, that's a concern. So you need to take that into consideration and, and try to get, um, maybe, maybe what, what the issue is, is working with them to figure out ways to improve that response rate. So here are some, some ways to think about it. If you think about this as a learning tree, and the, the roots of the tree are our assumptions, beliefs, and values about whatever it is that we need to learn about. And then we have emotions about it. And then there's knowledge that we need to construct and, and acquire. And then there's skills, things that we need to do. And our, our assumptions, beliefs, and values are going to impact the rest of the tree. So like the, the, the story I always tell is eighth grade algebra for Shelley Chapman. And I was not doing well. And my teacher focused on the top of the tree, knowledge and skills, knowledge and skills. But my problem was, first of all, I was very upset. And secondly, I um, assumed that all math is hard. I believed that I could never do math. <coughs> And I assumed I would never use algebra in my whole life. And so the teacher was working really hard on top of the tree, and I needed help with the bottom of the tree. So let's extrapolate from that to response rates. Can students access and complete the surveys easily and effectively? Yes, you're going to get global accessibility. They already have it on their, their um, tablets or their laptops. Is that what the user, of course, they value the reports? 
Um, do students know what faculty receive back and how the reports are used? Do faculty understand the reports? So if the faculty don't understand the reports, they're not using the reports, students don't know how, what's faculty being back for, it, they're not going to particularly um, want to fill out the form. And then how do faculty and students feel about the survey? Do so faculty feel like it's time? It's not my job. Um, who cares what students think anyway? It's just a popularity contest. Who knows? what some faculty might be thinking but or feeling about it. It's high stakes, they're going to be used against me. Um, and what do students feel about it? This is a waste of time. Nobody ever reads these anyway. Um, and that gets also down into the assumptions, beliefs, and values. If they believe nobody cares, they're not going to... If, so you see what I'm saying here? We can do everything we can for you know, communicating to them with social media, we can walk them to a lab, we can hand them paper and so forth, but really, what are they believing and valuing? That's also important. So while we work on making it accessible and while we work on communicating the value of the reports, we need to be thinking about everything um, involved in that tree. And so you want to talk to your faculty about that. Things to consider, what were the students' perceptions of their course and their learning? Uh, we've already talked about how to get the um, result, but now you want to look at it from the lens of uh, evaluating how well the faculty member did, and you'll go through this report with the faculty member, showing him or her how selecting those objectives has a direct impact on customizing the report. It isn't just another thing to do it customizes how the results are going to come out. And that's an important message for faculty to hear. And I think if they hear that, they're going to be less inclined to choose too many objectives. So as faculty evaluators, as faculty chairs of programs and departments, it will be helpful if you can have that conversation with them and help them see this is really, this really places power in your hands to help customize and tailor the report according to what you say is important, or what we as faculty say is important. So you would demonstrate all of that. Uh, I wanted to mention, too, that you can um, change this if you want. I think we know of one school that, has, that uses 33, 33, 33. This is just how we do it. It will come to you this way because clients ask for it that way, and that's the default. But if you decide you want to change that rubric, that's something you could do as a um, faculty evaluator. So you want to make sure you understand the adjusted scores. And here's how it works. Um, this is a uh, slide from uh, many tables in um, Technical Report 12, beginning of page 40. And along the left-hand side, you see the uh, subgroupings for work habits from high to low, high to 33. And across the top are the subgroupings for student motivation, high to low. Uh, item 39. And in the cells, I should have all of them, I don't have to be a slide, um, would be filled in with the average score that students gave for their progress on gaining factual knowledge when the faculty member selected it as an important course. <laughs> what you notice here is if you're lucky enough to have students who fall in the top 10% of the IDEA database in terms of their motivation and their work habits, they rate their learning on this objective more than one point higher than if you're unlucky enough to have students who fall in the bottom 10% of the IDEA database in terms of motivation. So what does this show us? It shows us that the type of students you have is going to have an impact on how they rate their learning. That's why we adjust the scores. We adjust it to the mean. So if I'm teaching my small class at Johns Hopkins of graduate students, and I've got seven students, and they're highly motivated, and great work habits, and you happen to be teaching a, a freshman level, first generation college students, gen ed class, and they don't know how to study yet, and they don't know whether they even want to be in college yet, and now you're going to compare your scores with mine, we know already what's going to happen. Just those variables alone tell us that my scores are going to come higher. So we adjust to the mean. So my scores, my adjusted scores, will actually go down. And your scores will actually adjust up, because we adjust to them. 
that is for comparison purposes. So if you need to compare your scores with mine, you use the adjusted score. So let's talk a little more about the purpose of the adjusted scores. If you want to learn how much the students learn, that's it. You can use the raw. Actually, I really should say how much, how did students perceive the learning? Because these are all indirect measures. And by the way, uh, let me just talk about that for a minute. Um, there are two major benefits of indirect measures. Because obviously you want direct measures, you want artifacts of student learning for assessment purposes. But indirect measures uh, help you to triangulate your data. And also they provide you with formative feedback that oftentimes direct measures do not provide. So you could get a student artifact, look at the uh, student work and see the, how well he or she did, but it doesn't necessarily give you the kind of feedback that tells you what you can do differently to help students make better progress next time. Next time. But the idea report can do that. And so there's value in indirect measures. So what were the stu instructor's contributions to learning? You can use adjusted. And how did faculty compare? You can use adjusted. <coughs> Here's a uh, flow chart that might be helpful. It's on our website, uh, in the blog section particularly. Just, just uh, search for adjusted scores and you'll see this. By the way, I have a, um, a three minute video on adjusted scores. So if you'd like to capture that, just click on that and watch three minutes of explanation of adjusted scores. It's there on the home page as well. So here's what you do. You start in the upper left hand corner. You ask, are the adjusted scores lower or higher than raw scores? If they are higher, go ahead and use the adjusted scores. It means you had a difficult hand dealt to you. You had a mountain to climb. You had some tough variables going on while you were helping your students make progress on learning. You were fighting some extraneous variables that were negative and having a negative impact. So go ahead and use the higher one. However, if they are lower, you have another question that you could ask. And the question is, do the raw scores meet or exceed expectations? Remember the expectations that we set earlier on. Now this is what happened to me. Every semester I taught at Johns Hopkins, my adjusted score was in So uh, the question was, were my scores, meet raw scores, meeting the expectation of my department? And they were. So since they were adequate, meeting expectations, the okay, let's back up for a minute. Let's say I'm teaching at Hopkins and my raw scores do not meet expectations. So they come in like a 2.9 or something. And you're my chair. You can call me in and you can say something like this, Shelly. You had a table set for you. You had the best students in the world. They didn't know how to study. They're motivated. They're a small class. And yet they're saying they do not make very much progress on that. Therefore, we're going to use the adjusted scores, which actually takes your scores down. And that would be an appropriate decision, a personnel decision. So this is a, a flow chart that you can keep in mind and think about as you decide whether to use raw or adjusted scores. So then you're going to use the data. Which data will you use and how? Well, you can keep track of your reports, and the beauty of what Ken just described is that soon and very soon, we'll have uh, the kinds of reports that will come to you that you can be able to keep track of over time. There is a worksheet that you can take a look at. You might want to just look at and get ideas on how you want to do this. It's on our website. It's called the Faculty Idea Worksheet. I think I have it, but I'll wait and pull it up later. Uh, and you plug in your data from your report. And then click at the bottom and you see graphs. So you can look for trends. So those are the kinds of things we're going to do for you with the digital reporting. Um, but the important thing here for faculty evaluation is to keep in mind that you want to look at longitudinal data. You want to look at how is this faculty member doing over time? What trends are you seeing? So you don't want to make a major decision about a person's life based on one report or one semester. So, for some of the purposes, you're going to use uh, criterion uh, or norm reference data, adjusted or raw, 
You'll have categories of performance already established. Your idea data will not exceed 30 to 50% of your teaching evaluation. And you're going to collect at least six to eight of those classes to make up that 30 to 50 percent. And we're going to talk about formative data more later, but uh, you'll just use those data for um, identifying areas to improve, to access resources, you even have conversations with different ideas. Like okay, so let me check the time here. Okay. What we want to do now is um, look in your folder for sample B. It has a red D on it, I think, is that correct? Do you all see a red D? Say yes or no. Your sample diagnostic form report it should have red markings on it. Oh, sample D, I think it's for sample D like David. Do you have that? Yes? You pulled it out of it. So if you can get that again, that'd be great. Now what I want to tell you is this. On the left hand side there's a yellow piece of paper called Guiding Questions for Interpreting Individual Reports. These questions are numbered. And the numbers correspond with the red numbers on your sample report. So this is scaffolding to help you practice interpreting a report. It's not the only way to interpret a report. It's just one way to get your feet wet to jump in and look at it. You may like it. You may decide to use it directly. You may say, oh, I did it once. I got the use out of it. It's up to you. But I'd like for us to spend some time right now in groups. And you can give groups however you wish. Three or no more than four people in groups. Two or three or four. And um, go for the yellow page with the report. and. Um, See how you do, what question you might have as a result of this. Okay? Pretend you're the faculty evaluator of this faculty. 